Hi there. In the last episode, I talked to you about the mistakes and flip-flops that scientists are committing during the pandemic. It's not good. It's understandable to some degree because science is being rushed. It's an emergency. I get it. Um, but it's not a good thing that science has to backtrack. Like I talked about in the last episode, three studies had to be retracted within a week. All right. The other problem is that the problem runs much deeper than that, and that's what I want to talk to you about today. You see, one of the cardinal features of the scientific method is replication. It means that if I do an experiment and I publish my results, if you follow my procedure, you should get exactly the same result as I did. And if you don't, there's a problem. And that's what we're facing today in science. A lot of scientific studies, too many of them, can't be replicated. Their results can't be vouched for. It's what we now call, and scientists themselves are calling, the replication crisis. This is a crisis that's affecting all sciences, including my own, physics, and even astronomy. But it's especially a problem in psychology. Psychology, it's a big problem. Sociology, economics, and medical science. And that's a bummer because that affects our health. But we're seeing this played out right now during the pandemic where studies can't be replicated or they're having to be retracted. These are studies when they were first published, not only got a lot of attention, but they affected public policy. So this is a big deal. This is not an ac academic issue that I'm talking about today, okay? So let me give you some examples of what I mean. Um, back in 2005, John Ioannidis, as a professor of medicine and statistics at Stanford, took 45 of the most famous medical studies ever published, 45 of them, and he tried to replicate them, all right? And guess what? He was only able to replicate fewer than half of them, 44%. That means 56%. Most of these studies, which are among the most famous medical studies ever published, cannot be vouched for. They can't be replicated. That's not science. That's not how science is supposed to be done. I don't know what you call that. Call it a crisis. All right. More recently, Anides and a colleague, an oncologist, looked at studies that claimed certain foods cause cancer. Now, you know, when these studies were originally published, they created a commotion. You know, you read these, oh my gosh, that's going to cause cancer. I'm not going to eat that food anymore. All right. I mean, these studies have a huge effect on our lives. And guess what? When Anides and his colleague looked carefully at the analysis in these experiments, in these studies, he found that the, the evidence does not show that any of these foods cause cancer. Zero. Zilch. All that pandemonium, all that panic for nothing. Again, that's not science. That's a crisis. Third example. More recently, in 2018, a group of scientists at Caltech looked at 21 major studies published in Science and Nature, two very prestigious scientific journals. And guess what? They were only able to replicate 13 of them. But that's not all. Of those that they were able to replicate, the result they found was only half the size, half the size of the original result claimed. Again, that's not science, my friend. That's a crisis. And finally, Nature, the journal I just mentioned, polled more than 1,500 scientists. And get this, more than three-fourths of the chemists and biologists said they had tried and failed to replicate studies of their colleagues. And worse than this, it's not a laughing matter. More than half of these chemists and biologists said they tried and failed to replicate their own experiments. What is going on? That's not what I trained to be a scientist for. I mean, this is not science. Anyways, so what's causing this replication crisis? Well, there are a lot of causes. Number one, carelessness, just outright carelessness. Scientists don't necessarily know how to design a good experiment. They design lousy experiments with like small sample sizes. Or when they do get their data, they don't know how to analyze it properly. Maybe they weren't schooled well in statistics and so they have faulty analysis. But it, whatever is the case, carelessness is a very important cause of this replication crisis. Number two, career pressures. 
You've heard publish or perish? Scientists are under enormous pressures to publish dramatic results, not itty bitty tiny results. Dramatic results that capture the headlines. That's what gets them the promotions and the awards and the funding, money talks. Scientists don't get any of that by publishing little tiny results or no results whatever. And yet, the progress of science depends both on negative results and positive results. A third cause of the replication crisis is bias. Now, more and more journals, I'm happy to say, are asking scientists to declare any conflicts of interest. But so far, no major journal that I know of is asking scientists to declare their politics, their political bias. And yet, today, science is more politicized than ever before. You've heard me say that before. This is a major problem. And that leads to part of the replication crisis. Fourth cause I'll mention is fraud, just outright fraud. You know, scientists are not holier than thou. I mean, um, for various reasons, they will oftentimes fudge their data. Now, some of them have got caught red-handed, and I've published some of that news. But a lot of them we haven't caught. And with the replication crisis being what it is, it's fair to wonder how much of it is caused by fraud. All right? So, look. Can you trust science because of this? Well, here's how I'm going to answer. You can trust the scientific method, all right? I've said a million times and I'll say it again. The scientific method is the most brilliant technique we've ever invented to understand the universe, to explain it rationally, all right? So you can trust the scientific method. But scientists are a different matter, all right? No matter how well educated they are, no matter which institution they're affiliated with, even Harvard. You saw in my last episode that some of those studies that were retracted were headed up by a scientist from Harvard. Okay, And no matter what awards they have, including the Nobel Prize, at the end of the day, we scientists are human. And so we're not above, sad to say, all those problems. Carelessness, career pressures, bias, and fraud. All right, so the best thing you can do, here's my best advice, is to be very skeptical about every single scientific study that is published and publicized, especially the scientific studies that get the headlines and get hyped by a media that unfortunately is clueless. The average reporter knows next to nothing about science. I mean, that's a fact. And I've been in this business for decades. I've seen it up close and personal. It's not pretty. All right. And the second thing you can do is to read the papers, the studies themselves. Don't not the what the reporters, the so-called reporters have to say about the studies, the studies themselves. Most studies today are published online. You can find them. And you're saying, no, no, Dr. G, I can't do that. I'm not a physicist. I'm not a medical scientist. I'm not a psychologist. You don't need to be. You'd be surprised when you start studying these papers, you'll, your sniffer, you'll sniff out something that doesn't quite sound right, all right? And the more you do it, the better you'll get at it. So give it a try. Don't sell yourself short. Really, that's the only way to protect yourself from getting suckered by studies that end up being wrong, that get retracted, as I talked about last episode, or that can't be replicated, all right? The replication crisis, it's real. All right? All right, that's it for now. As always, thank you for watching. Until next time, stay safe, stay strong, and above all, my friend, no matter what, stay positive.